So I've asked some of our speakers to think a little bit about what they view as one of the biggest opportunities or, and or risks in terms of security and privacy when it comes to AI. So machine intelligence is the theme for our afternoon and we're bridging the two by um, raising some, maybe some points for discussion over lunch. Uh, so um, you've been introduced to both Claudia and Ahmad, uh, but we have a new, a new face on stage. So uh, I'd like to welcome Mark Girolami, uh, who will probably get a, a decent introduction a little bit later this afternoon. He will be speaking after lunch, but I can at least give you a little bit of context by saying that he's professor in statistics at Imperial College in London and program director of the Alan Turing Institute there, amongst many other things. Uh, and Mark will give us, I think, more of the big data AI perspective uh, on, on risks uh, and opportunities. Um, but I, I think I'll start with Claudia, if I may. Uh, so what's your take on this question? So what the question is, um, what are the risks Microphone. of AI? Uh, do you have the, this? Ah, you need to, may I? Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. So, I mean, from, from a privacy point of view, of course, AI is extremely challenging and big data is extremely challenging. Um, one of the main problems, especially also in relationship to existing rules on, on what we can do with private data, is uh, the, the difficulty of a specifying purpose when you're uh, collecting data from people that you will feed into a big data algorithm in the sense that very often you do not know which kind of inferences you will be making about those people and which kind of decisions will be done upon uh, those inferences. And of course that creates a, a lot of uncertainty in the sense that you, do, you really don't know what kind of risks you're opening yourself to in terms of both disclosing data about yourself, but also in terms of decisions that will affect your life that might mean that you get a job or you don't get a job, that might mean you get a medical treatment or you don't get a medical treatment, so decisions that can be extremely important for your life will be made based on this data in a way that was not predictable when you provided the data. So I think that's extremely challenging. Um, and, and personally, I, I find that the risks with AI are both that is very good in doing what it should do and not good enough in doing what it should do. So the, the fact that it's very good in doing what, what it should do, I mean, we have all seen already these uh, studies that say, okay, if I see your Facebook likes, if I see your web history, I can really infer a lot of things about you. I can really know really deep things that even you yourself might not even know about yourself or even your spouse, very close people to you do not know, right? So the accuracy in kind of extracting very intimate private information about people, this is very dangerous. The fact that it's uh, not good enough, I would say that there is also, I have the impression sometimes with people who work in big data, people who are machine learning, that they believe too much in the results of their inference. And I think we still have to, to like the, the, it seems almost that the data is the truth, right? And this is not necessarily the case in the sense that you might have a, a data can be biased. They, we know data sets are inherently biased. We know um, uh, when we are, uh, especially we, we, you don't have the same representation for different groups of people. So when you're making inferences about groups of people and making decisions that affect different people depending on their characteristics, you might be building in or entrenching things like discrimination, for example, meaning that now you have algorithms deciding whether people have access or not to, to certain services or to certain benefits or whatever. And it might be that certain groups are disproportionately disadvantaged based on the data that was collected that already has a bias in it. Right? So I think it's a bit of like Ahmad criticized lawyers and business people. No, no, I love I'm going to say that sometimes computer scientists, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes computer scientists, they kind of confuse the model for the reality. The model is a simplification of reality. It has abstracted away a lot of complexity that exists in reality. And one has to be able to take a little bit of distance and think critically about what is the output is and not just take it as computer says yes or no. Right? Okay, that Thank was you. Uh, 
That was very nice. Maybe I can, if I take uh, Ahmed's perspective okay. now, <coughs> give, giving Mark uh, the sort of last word. Okay. Uh, so, so what's your take on the so, biggest risks and opportunities? So f first of all, disclaimer, uh, what I said about business people and lawyers is not <laughs> the, the, the view of my university. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I must say I am a kind of on, uh, along the lines that uh, Claudia mentioned. I, I have... I have started this uh, initiative, uh, at least uh, in Germany. I think that when we talk about data analytics, oh wow, what happened there? Okay, um, when we talk about data, <laughs> I thought maybe a lawyer called. I, <laughs> about, I, I think that data analytics uh, is very interesting, very challenging, and uh, also, as you said, many people really religiously believe in, in that, and it is a big hype now. In, in, uh, I remember as I studied, neural networks were, were very popular, and uh, that is some time ago. Um, my, idea, my view, actually, my personal view is that scientists, independent data analytics scientists, will play no role in the future because they don't have access to real data. They either work for enterprises like Google, Amazon, that pay up to $450,000 first salary to get data analysts, or they are dependent on their data. It will not, this is my really belief, that we are not, if, if today data analysts you are not going as a research, independent researchers, you are not going to play a role. And the deep state, to be no conspiracy, but the, the deep state will be those providers that are going to work with governments, that are going to come into your sleeping room because they know what you are doing, because they already analyze your data. And that is my picture of the future, and I think we have to do something against it. We should obfuscate everything that we do. And think about it. If I make a device and give it to you, it allows all these data <laughs> leeches, yeah, all, all, all these uh, data-hungry companies who really want to control to you, and now, they are building software when you die and your beloved people want, want to talk to you. They hold the communication over Twitter and, and Facebook and all the things that you are revealing can be put together and put in AI and one day somebody will talk to you as your partner. If this, this partner has died, I don't, I don't hope, but if that happens. And then one day they tell you, hey, maybe you, uh, wo uh, you uh, elect the, the, the far right uh, or racist uh, party. I always loved that, but I didn't tell you at that time before I died. Yeah? And some people will believe that because many of us are still in the preferred world and poor people will be those guys who are going to lose themselves in this virtual world because rich people can make their avatars whenever they want. And I think that one day we will go back to old days where there was physical books and we hope that nobody looks at us because everybody will be transparent. So this is my very, very uh, um, exciting view of the yeah, future. That, were, that, were, that, was quite, that was quite black, I think. Yes. Yeah. I think black hair doesn't... Uh, <laughs> this is why I have black slides. So I think... <laughs> I, I, I really think that... I, am, I started this initiative some time ago with some colleagues, uh, the, the so-called concerned scientists, and there are some of them in Silicon Valley after they made billions with Google. Now they, have, uh, they think, oh, we are concerned. We should do something against Facebook. We should have an obfuscator, a device that allows them to do their functionality, provide their anal uh, data analysis, that, but they cannot... Uh, um, th that means adversarial machine learning from users. Users should do adversarial machine learning, that they get the wrong data. Sorry. Some privacy technologies do that already. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but, but you need a device. You need a device that says, here, push here, and everything works. We want that device. Okay, I, I'd like to hand over to Mark, and I hope, Mark, that we can get a bit of an upbeat tone from you, but... Yeah. <laughs> okay, can, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, my, my view is that um, there are two great technologies that have emerged, um, and that is big data and artificial intelligence. And I am very upbeat about them. I am very excited to be working uh, 
in this, at this particular time um, on basic science and translating that basic science to commercial products, services and processes. And it's all oiled by big data and artificial intelligence. So let me start with big data. Now the first thing is that big data is nothing new. Okay, there's nothing mystical about big data. There is nothing magical about big data. And what I want to do is I want to take you back to the very first big data analysis that ever took place. And it caused a revolution, right, in industrial processes and in commercial activity. And it was all started by a young Cambridge astronomer who went to work uh, at Rothamsted in the United Kingdom. Rothamsted was the agricultural research station uh, of the UK. It had been running for well over a century and it was looking at how to improve crop yields, how to design fertilizers to improve those uh, crop yields and, and so forth. And for over a hundred years, they had been gathering data about the experiments that they had been doing. And all this data was gathered together. Now this was in 19, uh, 1917. So there was uh, no digital storage. So lots of handwritten uh, ledgers of all of these experiments. And Fisher was given the job, find the knowledge and find the golden nuggets of, of information in there that we've missed. Show us where we can find the next killer fertilizer or the next killer pe uh, insecticide or what is the best type of uh, um, uh, planting pattern in a field for some sort of uh, very important crop. And so for the next couple of years, Fisher set to that job and what did he find in this lake of data? He found nothing. He found that the data that had been gathered confounded itself. It was completely biased and it was lacking in the information to answer the questions and find the gold uh, that Rothamsted uh, managers wanted. And what Fisher then did as he completely invented the whole uh, enterprise of modern day statistical science upon which machine learning, upon which artificial intelligence is based upon. And the key thing that he said was is that you don't call the statistician after you've done the experiment. It's like calling the surgeon once the patient is dead. And I think the points that have been made by my colleagues here is that just because we are living in an era of big data, we can instrument everything. We can instrument ourselves, we can instrument what we do or what we're about to do. But the question is, is, th is the data that's being generated and that we are gathering, is it sufficient to answer the questions that we uh, either should be asking or are asking. So I would be very positive, but say that we need to have that truckload of salt when someone says, I've got this great data and it's got great value. Well, has it really? So that's the first thing. I would say that, that, that big data uh, and this data era is fantastic. Now, what about artificial intelligence? Um, for me, if I look at what artificial intelligence is, it's applied maths, it's applied statistics, it's engineering, it's control systems, it's cognitive science. I don't see too much about intelligence in there, never, n never mind what is artificial about it. And I think that this is a healthy view to have, that when someone says I've got a new artificial intelligence, what they mean is they have 
a new mathematical model or representation with some new fancy uh, search method or heuristics to, to improve those search methods. And maybe they, they might even have a proof of existence or, 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 uh, or, or efficiency. Usually not. Uh, and maybe some algorithm that's been hacked together that, that actually does something. And I think if you look at artificial intelligence in those terms, then you'll see how exciting and what the opportunities are, rather than being potentially hoodwinked into accepting something that's probably nothing more than K nearest neighbors matching in some very high dimensional space. So hopefully I've been upbeat, um, but... Um, <laughs> But noted some caution <laughs> that um, there is an awful lot of hype and hoax uh, about big data and artificial intelligence. But I think if we you know, keep our sensible heads on, then this is a fantastic time uh, to be engaging with basic science and with basic science engaging with commercial uh, and uh, industrial enterprises. Thank you very much, Mark. So... Uh, on that fantastic upbeat note, I wonder if there's any passion in the audience, uh, <laughs> burning question. I see one uh, at the back here. If you uh, hungry. <laughs> do you, the question is, do you think that besides ML, we need HL, as in human learning? Uh, and I, I think a question for Mark. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think if we, if, you know, if, if we sit down and stop being human and stop learning, then we become ignorant. And, 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 and as, a, as a tribe, we then start to stagnate. But perhaps the question you're asking is not so much the philosophical one about um, how, how people and how, how nations develop in terms of their intellectual endeavors but more about the technology that if we employ machine learning methods within some sort of technical system, should the human still be within the loop and help the learning process? And I think the answer is, it depends. In some cases, yes, that's absolutely necessary. And in other cases, um, no, we can, we can have fully automated machine learning solutions. So it just depends, in yeah. my view. Claudia, yeah, something to yeah if, if I may say, I think, I think we need human learning to live in a world where machine learning is deployed <laughs> everywhere. Because I think we, are, we normally ad adjust our behavior to our environment, and this environment is changing now in invisible ways. We're very used to read other people. We, are, we have good brains for that, for you know, checking signals with others, seeing whether the things we're doing are being well-received or bad-received this kind of thing, right? I think in the f increasingly, the ones making these judgments are not other people, but they are algorithms that are much more difficult for us to understand. And I think we will have a learning process to how do we live and act in a world where we are being observed and analyzed and judged by these algorithms. Okay, thank you very much. So. In the interest of time, now that our, our lunch is actually ready and waiting for us, I would like to conclude this morning's session. And um, I would like to mention that we will resume again shortly after one o'clock. Uh, you'll get a chance to see Mark again. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. But before then, I would like you to join me in thanking our panelists here and in fact, all our speakers from this morning. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>